So the six reasons you love someone or any person, number one is obviously jamal, beauty. You see someone that's attractive, automatically fall in love with them. Somebody goes and opens the door for you. Mashallah, things are going forward really quickly. Um, no, it's, it's, it's infatuation, but nevertheless, it's a form of love. But that's not the only type of love, right? Jamal. The second thing is Kamal. Kamal is when someone's really good at something. Someone's a good baller. Someone's good at uh, making some makeup videos. Someone is good at uh, um, any type of skill set. There's an automatic respect for that person. There's an automatic love and admiration for them. We idolize people based on their skill set. So the first thing is Jamal. The second thing is Kamal. The third thing is Nawal. Nawal is when someone does something for you. When people do favors for you, automatically there's a sense of love for that person. They've done something for me. Or that's how an individual should be. You should never forget a favor of another person. Um, number four, you have Jamal, Kamal, Nawal. Number four is Mal. Mal is wealth. When a person is wealthy, automatically people want to be friends with that person, even though that person could be the stingiest person in the world. Right? We're, we, just, we just get attracted to wealthy people. They drive a nice car, uh, they have money, and there's automatically a sense of inclination towards individuals. Um, number five, when there's people who may not do much for us or do anything for us, but they have an immense amount of love for us. Um, and it's unconditional. It doesn't, have, uh, it doesn't have to be for any reason. Just, just people in your life that just love you. Right? They just have a love. It could be a relative. It could be a friend. Uh, it could be a student. It could be uh, a teacher. It could be in any capacity. Uh, and number six, uh, a parently figure in our life. Someone who's mentored us through. Um, it could be our own physical, biological parents, or it could be someone secondary. All six things were found in Rasulullah And I can go on for hours just expounding on those six things. Um, However, today I just want to speak about the first point, which is the beauty of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, and next week, I'll go into describing every attribute of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There's this, uh, there's this really interesting uh, story of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he meets this woman um, on the way to Medina. And uh, she sees him only once in his life. And she goes and she describes him in a manner uh, that is incredibly poetic. Um, and it's incredibly detailed. Uh, it's incredibly touching. Uh, and she's only seen the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam one time. Most of the companions could not describe the Prophet Sallallahu Very few people described the Prophet Sallallahu The reason was that um, in his glory and in the greatness that Allah had bestowed upon him, most people could not encompass the visual nature of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Amr ibn al-As, radiallahu anhu, the famous uh, conqueror of Egypt, he conquered uh, Egypt in a totally assassin creed uh, sort of way. He says that I fought against the man, I fought with him, and I fought for him after, after he passed away. And he sp spent decades around the Prophet ﷺ. On his deathbed when he was passing away, the hadith is a Muslim, his son was like, you know, you're, you're, you have great accolades, you have, you have great accomplishments, and you've lived a legacy. So the father listens to all this, and there were people that didn't get flattered. And one time a Sahabi went to another and he said that, uh, one person went to a, uh, a Sahabi and he said, I saw you in Jannah in the morning. Uh, I, was, I was sleeping in a dream, I saw you in Jannah. If somebody comes to us and says that, hey man, I saw a dream and you were in Jannah, like, you're not the first one to tell me that. And I hear this all the time. Um, but there were people that didn't get flattered. They didn't look for people's flattery. They didn't look for uh, commendation from other people, appreciation. They didn't care for those things. They didn't matter to them. They cared what God thought about them. So he listens in and he says, my boy, are you done? And the kid says, yeah, I'm done. I'm, I'm, I'm done to what I wanted to say. He said, Wallahi, I am fearful of standing before Allah, and I wish that neither my good or bad is judged for me on the day of judgment, and I, sta I, I have fear of standing before God. And then he says an iconic statement. He says, Wallahi, law qila li usibdana Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ma astati'u fa li anni ma amlaytu aynayya qatfu ijalalan lahu. He said, Wallahi, if someone was to tell me to describe the Prophet to me, I promise to God I cannot, for I never looked up and got a full glimpse of him. And when I would be in the man's company, my head would be down with awe and respect. And only few people could describe the Prophet ﷺ. One of them was his wives. His wives, obviously, they shared an intimate relationship with him. Number two was Anas bin Malik. Uh, he was like the Prophet Sallallahu uh, helper at home. For 10 years, he served the Prophet Sallallahu And we'll talk a lot about him. He's a really cool person um, throughout. 
And uh, obviously, Ali radiallahu anhu, his grandchildren, they could describe the Prophet And then there was this one man, his name was Abu Hada. And most of us probably never heard of him. He could describe the Prophet Does anyone know why Abu Hada could describe the Prophet Go ahead. Is that his uh, foster mother's husband? I think. No. No. Okay. Good. Good try. I'll give you this one. You're a bit close. You have to go through a few relationships to get to it. He was. He was the people of As Sufa. There were seventy there, but none could describe the Prophet. What's the question? There were very few people who described the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Most of them were only family members. And then there was one anomaly, there was this one woman who saw him one time, and she could describe the Prophet Sallallahu And the rest of the Sahaba generally could describe aspects of him, but a full-on description, they couldn't. Besides, there's this other person, Abu Hada, who's not very well known, but he could describe the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi really well. And he was known as Wassa. He was known as the guy you went to, to hear the description of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ghana Wassa. He was the son of Khadija radiallahu from her previous marriage and he was present at the Prophet's wedding. So he saw the Prophet from a 25 year old, 24 year old, 23 year old young man all the way past 63, passed away and onwards. So he had spent a chunk of his time with the Prophet sallallahu and he knew the Prophet sallallahu well before prophethood. That's why, for example, myself, uh, there's a lot of people that, uh, that see me grow up. So I just came from Toronto uh, yesterday, and there's a lot of people there. My uncle's there and a lot of uh, family friends there. And uh, despite how other people may appreciate or respect, but when these people will see, they'll say, well, I knew you when you were a little kid. To me, you're not Mufti Wasim, you're just Wasim to me. You're just this. I saw you running around and messing around and doing this and that. And sure, the person can rise on their scale, but they'll always remain the kid, uh, a kid to you. And the same thing, you know, mashallah, Zishan, uh, no matter how much of a vice president he is, but he'll still be... Uh, 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 no, I've just seen him the way he is beautiful. <laughs> but um, uh, Abu Hana could describe the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So a little bit on the beauty of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and and I just want to give you a little uh, uh, advertisement or a promo. And then next week we will go through the ev every single uh, attribute of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And over the next few weeks, inshallah, till the end of the semester, we will go and describe in depth every aspect of the man himself, right from his smile, from his talking, from his sitting, from the how he told stories, how he, uh, how his interactions were with the kids, how they were with his elders, all over, inshallah. So speaking about the beauty of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Hassan bin Thabit, he was known as the poet of the Prophet sallallahu and he describes the Prophet in this amazing poetry, and he says, وَأَحْسَنَ مِنْكَ لَمْ تَرَقَ الدُّعَيْنِ وَأَحْسَنَ مِنْكَ لَمْ تَرَقَ الدُّعَيْنِ وَأَجْمَلَ مِنْكَ لَمْ تَلِدْ النِّسَاءُ he says, well, over here, first he talks about inner beauty. Because you can get so many beautiful people, but ugly people from inside. And people are so focused on beautifying their outside that we forget that our insides are incredibly ugly. You know, you see those fairy tales, uh, movies, or those uh, shows where you have this like beautiful princess or this beautiful witch, and she looks into the mirror and she looks really ugly, right? It's because there's this curse on her, or this wizard who looks really young, but then when he looks into a mirror, um, it looks really ugly, uh, and whatever the spell they've enchanted. And that's what sort of we've done in our life. We've enchanted ourselves with this outer beauty, and we fooled ourselves. And we begin to think we're as beautiful as we look in the mirror. But every beautiful person will lose their beauty. Every uncle you see on the masjid sitting on a chair with a shiny top on their head, they were all dashing looking people when they were young. Every, every grandma that you see, once upon a time, she was the most beautiful amongst her friends. But beauty is a transitory thing. It's limited. And that's why even in relationships and love, beauty should not be a cornerstone. It's something good to have. It's something good to look for. You shouldn't not uh, care about beauty. Beauty is important. Once Sahabi got married, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told everyone, he said, uh, um, you all should get married. You know, all you young people, yeah, yeah, you all should get married. So one guy got really excited. He went, he went to the first girl he found. He's like, hey, you trying to get married? She's like, yeah. And he's like, all right, we're done. We're married. Comes back to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's like, yeah, Rasulullah, so, you know, uh, I did it. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was like, who's the girl? He's like, I'm still trying to figure that out. And uh, 
He's like, wait, did you even see the girl? He's like, no, I didn't see her. And the Prophet is like, no, make sure you see them before you get married. And uh, she actually had blue eyes or green eyes. And amongst the Arabs, that wasn't considered attractive. Uh, so he was like, maybe after you're married, you might not find that attractive. Yeah, times changed, right? Um, anyway, so he says, My eyes have not fell upon an individual who encompasses inner beauty more glorious than yours. Women are unable to give birth to a baby to grow into a man or a woman more beautiful than yourself. Humans do not have the potential to give birth to an individual more beautiful than you. Allah created him perfect in so many ways. There's actually a debate. Who's the most beautiful? Is it the Prophet Sallallahu is it Yusuf Arisada, who was known to be really beautiful? Or is it, who's the third person? Osman. Who is the third person that there's a debate about that when it comes to beauty? The Prophet no. Yusuf Arisada. And it's a, it's, it's a hard argument between these three. Is it a Prophet? Uh, Alright, I'll give you a hint, it's a Prophet. Daoud? Do you guys have more chairs here? Wait, what, what was the other stand? So everyone can have a uh, nice seat. Unless you guys like standing. So, Dawood? Dawood he had the yeah, most beautiful so, voice out of all the prophets. Uh, and he would, when he would do dhikr of Allah and call upon God, the animals, the inanimate and animate would begin to sing with him. The most, one of the most beautiful out of all the prophets where there's a debate, who's the most beautiful? One is the Prophet, one is Yusuf salam, and the third is Adam Ali uh, uh, Why? Why is Adam Ali salam a debated topic? Because of what you just said. No, I know, but why? <laughs> <laughs> because Allah created him personally, not directly. Allah created him personally with his own hands. Allah created Adam Ali salam. So who holds the most beauty? So the answer is that Yusuf Ali salam, though is, was considered very beautiful. He possessed half the beauty that Allah had created. Allah created beauty, and he gave half of it to Yusuf Ali Salam, and half to all creatures of his time, of his era. Sarah, the wife of Ibrahim Ali Salam, she, was, she had one-sixth of the beauty of all uh, uh, creation of her time. So she became the mother of many, many prophets. She was incredibly beautiful. And um, Adam Ali Salam was created by Allah. However, despite each of them carrying their beauty, the Prophet's beauty eclipsed every other individual's beauty. So the poet says, It is as if you told Allah, this is how I want to get made. You know, everybody doesn't like, somebody doesn't like their nose. Someone doesn't like their eyebrows. Someone doesn't like their hair. Someone doesn't like some feature of their body. Right? And imagine, like, you know, and then you make these, like, bitmojis on Snap, right? Where it looks nothing like you. But it's like, it's like, hey, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's it's a sense of closure. Or you take a picture and then you keep on applying the filters until like you get the right one. Um, and then I hear there's apps now that can make you grow older and younger too. So you're, you're able to change your appearances. Uh, and in Jannah, there's actually gonna be a mall, a bazaar, where you can go and just swap out parts. Yeah, it's pretty, I don't know. Uh, you go there, you don't like your note? And then you just go and just go fish your nose. That's like, you know, that's what you like. All right, put it back in. You want different colored eyes? You don't need to put contacts on. You just pop them out. It's probably less gruesome than that. But uh, uh, the point is, is that uh, you're able to go and make yourself look beautiful from a physical sense. So the Prophet Sarsim had this enormous beauty. One time there was a Sahabi sitting down, and he says that I looked at the Prophet Sarsim, and I don't, I don't know how often you guys get this chance, but uh, after every. Every time I look at the moon after hearing this hadith, I reflect on this hadith. And um, the moon has many names. The Arab Arabic is a very deep language. If you do one thing in life, learn Arabic. I can't, like, being a scholar and studying, I mean, we're all students of knowledge, right? we're not technically scholars, but um, after all the studying I've done, if you were to tell me, if you had, only ch if you had a choice to only study one out of all of those things, and there's hadith, tafsir, fiqh, and all of those things there. I would say that I'm grateful for studying Arabic. Because when I stand behind the imam in salah, 
at times we all have our struggles. But then every day there's a, there, there's a lesson and there's a lecture for us in prayer. And I, I mean, we, 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 we remedy that by giving khatras and lectures outside of prayer. But the reality is in the Prophet's time, there weren't this many lectures. He spoke once a week. They said, Ya Rasulullah, talk to us more. He had one women's session and he had one general session. He had a ladies' session and a general session. And he generally didn't talk more than that. And few words. And people would say, can you give us more lectures? And he would say, no. Because I don't want you to get overburdened by it. And I don't want you to feel, and this is the prophet speaking, the most eloquent of us all. But this is the wisdom. That all right, even you take Islam, it's, just, it's not like every day you're in classes, and you know, Monday this, Tuesday that. No, no, no. Take a break. So anyway. Um, Arabic, when you're praying Salah, and you hear the Imam recite the verse of Quran, at times it's miraculous. At times, it's like Allah is specifically speaking to you. And that's the beauty of our prayer. We have 30 juz, 114 surahs. The imam picks one randomly and recites it in prayer. And there's hundreds of people behind him. It's bound to hit somebody. Mm. It's bound to connect with somebody. And the message is timeless. So Arabic is a very deep language. They have 600 words for just lion. That's the word lion. It, there's 600 words for it. And, 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 and it's, 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 it's a very beautiful language. So just the way that in, with the moon, there's, there's a lot of names for the moon. So the Sahabi says, I saw the Prophet Sallallahu and I saw the full moon. He uses the word that, con- that, uh, that, uh, that um, indicates a full moon. And the full moon is the 14th of the lunar calendar, not of the, not of the solar calendar. Right? You don't go out on uh, September 14th or August, October 14th and be like, oh, where's the moon? Um, but actually, this month is actually connected. So it may work. Um, <laughs> So he looks at the full moon, right? The 14th moon is like, it's bright. And, and, and it's, got this, it's got this soothing brightness to it. And, and, and you, and you have, uh, does anyone name Samir here? Samir, no? Does anyone know a Samir? It's a very famous name. Samir actually means the one who speaks in moonlight from summer. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi prohibited us from having chit chats after Isha. They would say, pray Isha and then go to sleep. Don't sit there and do summer, meaning the late night talks. And that's like our, that, that's our, uh, that's what we do. Right, so after Isha is when we get on our phone in our bed and that's it, and we're just sitting there texting away. Right, where this Prophet Sallallahu said, never do this, right, don't do this. It's actually uh, disliked and makru uh, to do this. One of my teachers, Mona Suleiman Choksi, my entire time of knowing him, 10 p.m., the man's out right away, folks. Doesn't matter, he's up for Tahajjit. These were people who use the night. We all use the night. Some use the first part, some use the last part. And the last part is the most valuable part. So anyway, so he says, I looked at the prophet, and the prophet was wearing a red garment. And uh, I looked at him, and I was like, man, he is just so breathtaking as an individual that Allah has made him so perfect. And I looked at the moon, and I said, who's glowing more, the moon or the prophet? (laughs) And then after a little while, he was like, no, the prophet is more beautiful. So a poet responds and says, how many understand Urdu here? Let's see if you really understand that here. Um, the poet responds, and the poet says, "Chand se bhi tashbeed de na, ye bhi kya insaf hai, uske chare pe da hai, inka chara saaf." He says, "How can you even put the prophet and the moon in the same sentence? The moon has craters and blemishes, while the prophet's skin is completely blemish-free. He's like, you can't even put them in the same equation." One poet said that when when women saw Yusuf Ali Salam. They were so awestruck in his beauty, when he was walking, they were cutting some fruit. They didn't notice and they began cutting their fingers. And he says the beauty of the finger of the prophet was such that when he indicated towards the moon, the moon itself broke in half. So the Prophet Sallallahu was this individual who encompassed physical beauty aside from his inner beauty, which is undeniable. His physical beauty was also remarkable and the most remarkable that anyone uh, uh, anyone possessed. So anyway, next week, inshallah, we're going to talk about the story of uh, Umm Ma'bad who saw the Prophet Sallallahu while he was traveling to Medina and then she described him to her husband. And it's a very beautiful description, inshallah, we'll go over that. Um, and as far as the questions are concerned uh, for today. You want to start with the ones? Who is this? <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's my monkey. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. yeah, both have the same hair color. Yeah. <laughs> you want to start with these questions? Yeah. 
We're good? Okay. Yeah. If you want to ask more questions, you can, uh, you can ask them uh, by going on that link. Apparently, it's case sensitive. Uh, otherwise, you, you end up at LAMPS on Amazon for some reason. You know, just refresh it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, these, th these are enough questions, inshallah. Okay. The first question is, is it permissible to thread eyebrows? Uh, this is a question I get when, uh, on Instagram every, uh, every now and then I do something called Ficker Fiction, which is basically I ask questions. Uh, uh, I let anybody ask questions and I answer them. Without fail, every single time, I get two, three of these. Every single time. Is it permissible to thread eyebrows? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has prohibited uh, the threading of eyebrows. He's actually in the Hadith of Bukhari has said that Allah sends his curse on those who thread their eyebrows. Now, if you have a very, very uh, bushy, connected eyebrow, that's a different story. You know, you can cleanse it, clean it, and, 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 and remove the, the excess hair. But you can't do landscaping on it. Like, you can't sit there making it pencil thin, right? That's not the purpose of it. The reason is, is that everyone's endowed with different beauty. And, and now that's subjective, right? What's a lot and what's little is subjective. There's no, there's no like, uh, uh, print that you just go model, you put on your eyebrows, that is this is the size of an eyebrow, right? It doesn't work like that. But the point is, is that... There is more beauty to you inside than outside. We are so focused on, 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 on perfecting the outer beauty that we forget the inner beauty. And that's what the Prophet ﷺ was trying to focus on. That don't sit there for hours and hours trying to get this perfection of outer beauty, but spend hours and hours trying to perfect your inner beauty because that will take you further and that will take you longer. Number two, can men wear chains? Uh, women can wear chains. They can wear uh, gold, silver, whatever type. Uh, but for men, can men wear chains? Uh, when Allah describes the people of Jahannam in the Quran, He says that they're, 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 they have aglal, they have chains around their necks. Um, those things that, are, that were specifically mandated by the Prophet Sallallahu for the other gender, for female genders, uh, it is not permissible for men to adopt those type of qualities, right? Some things that are particular for them. Piercings, particular for them. Uh, uh, gold, particular for them. Jewelry, particular for them. Uh, men can't adopt that. Uh, and I tell youth very often, I tell them that um, if we can't resemble the people of Jannah, let's at least not try to resemble the people of Jannah. If we can't replicate and reflect the people of Jannah, that one chain isn't going to make you look so beautiful or it's not going to really make a difference in your looks. But it's about, is it something that you can give away for Allah's sake? Now, sometimes we enter Jannah not because of the biggest deeds. We enter Jannah because of our greatest struggles. And for some people, that's their biggest struggle. For some people, it's a small action, not threading their eyebrows. It's a small action, but it's the biggest struggle for them or it's a hard struggle for them and they did it only for Allah. And Allah doesn't count deeds on the day of judgment. He weighs them. And maybe that one deed is the weightiest of them all. So don't see it's too, any action as too small because it may just be the action that propels you into paradise in Jannah. Uh, yeah. So no Allah chains? Yeah, Allah chains or any other chains. It doesn't mean like, all right, if I put Allah on it, it just becomes a halal sign. You got a halal chain. I so said this chain is halal. No, 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 you can't. Not, no Allah chains, no, no halal chains, none of those things. Um, in my community in, in Plano, the youth that are close to me, one of the things that I tell them is that at least in the masjid, don't wear it. If it's hard for you to stop completely, at least in the masjid, don't wear it. Right? You, there, there, there's places of doing things, right? The masjid is a sacred place. Abstain from the masjid outside. We all have our battles and we all have the things that are tough for us. It's just about us trying to get help and become a better person. Uh, number three, how do we get over a broken heart? Um, don't wear a chain. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> so the heart is something that's very interesting, right? It comes from the Arabic word called qalb. Does anyone know what qalb means? Anyone speak Arabic here? One person? Two? Three? Four? Five? Where are you from? Uh, Palestine. Palestine? Saudi Arabia? Palestine? Sudan. Sudan. Okay, so we have a few different dialects here. It's good. Um, what does qalb mean? Does anyone know what qalb means? Heart. Yeah, but what does it literally mean? Yeah. Qalb comes from the Arabic word qalaba, which means to flip. Inqilab is a revolution because it flips what was already happening. So the reason a qalb is called a qalb is because emotions constantly flip and people's feelings constantly change. And there's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ that says, 
that our hearts are between the fingers of Rahman, and that Allah can ch change them and alter them in any way. Now this is, is, there's a lot of explanation and definition to this, but to stay focused on the point of how do you get, how do you resolve over a heart that's been shattered? Before I go into this, the concept of giving our heart to someone. Our heart is a very precious thing. There was a poet that's, I like poetry, um, but I'll translate it for you. There's a poet that said that the heart beats in my chest, but it's unfortunate that it belongs in your hands. It's close to me, but it couldn't become mine, and it's far from you, but it became yours. Um, the heart's very interesting. And at times, we don't willingly give it to someone. You, you, don't, you don't choose who you give your heart to. The Prophet ﷺ had multiple wives, but he would tell Allah that, Ya Allah, I treat them all equally, but when it comes to loving them, I can't control myself who I love more and who I love less. That's not in my control. Don't hold me accountable for that. If the Prophet could not control that emotion, for most of us, that's a struggle for us. Someone called me last night and asked me a question about two people that got married and they were not okay with their marriage and said, what can we do? And I was like, it's not that simple that you just go to someone and be like, all right, you know what? You can't see them anymore. It doesn't end like that. Yeah, maybe like 50 years ago, there wasn't Snapchat, Instagram. I mean, we're just stalkers, right? Uh, you, some you can't see them anymore. All right, just grab your phone and you're just seeing them at that moment, right? You can't see her anymore and that's it. You're just following them on social media. It's, it's hard to break away from someone. And the first and foremost thing is this is the most precious thing you possess. This is everything. The Prophet Sallallahu said there's a body, there's, there's, a, there's an organ in the body. If it is good, everything is good. And if it's corrupt, everything is corrupt. And that's this. This is the most powerful thing you possess. It possesses everything. It, 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 it functions. It keeps nur inside. It keeps light inside. It keeps Allah inside. It keeps everything inside. It's a very powerful organ. And giving it away hastily to someone is, is, is the whole purpose. That, that's not what we're supposed to do. Ali radiallahu anhu says, أحبب حبيبك هون ما عسى أن يكون بغيذك يوم ما وأبغذ بغيذك هون ما عسى أن يكون حبيبك يوم ما If you love someone, love them moderately. One day you may end up hating them. And if you hate someone, hate them moderately. One day you may end up loving them. Be, be intellectual with your emotions. Don't be incredibly emotional with your emotions. But use your mind and intellect. And when you love someone, regardless of who they are, they could be your wife, they could be your kids, they could be your husband, they could be your parents, they could be anybody. There is a level of love you give anybody. You don't love someone so far ahead that if they're removed from the equation, you're devastated and you spiral away and, and, and you can't focus anymore. And that's the whole concept. The Prophet of Allah says in Bukhari that we can't be perfect believers until the prophets, we love the Prophet and by definition, Allah, more than our families, our children, and everybody in the world. Why? Now, what's the, what's the philosophy behind that? Because every person that you love will either, one of two things will happen. Either at one point in life, they won't be there for you. Now, this can either be physically, that they just left somebody somewhere else and they're not with you anymore, or it could be, emotion, uh, or it could be literally in the sense that they've passed away. But every beloved we have, we will lose one day. It's, it's, it's bound to happen. Or either you will pass away in front of them. But we will lose all of our beloved. And if we give undy this, this relentless and this like Bollywood type of love to anybody, when that person is gone from our life, we're devastated. And that's what happens. We start breaking down. And everything in life starts crashing on us. Because we've invested too much in one person. Most people are unable to love themselves. How are they going to love someone else more than that? We struggle to love ourselves. We struggle to fulfill our own needs and fulfill our own obligations. How can we fulfill someone else's obligations? How can we complete someone else when we are struggling ourselves? So the first thing is, is that be careful of who you give your heart to. And when you give your heart to someone, know that things can change. The heart is called heart because emotions change. And it happens all the time. I mean, it's the most unfortunate things. 30 years, people are married. 40 years, they're married. And they walk and I don't love him anymore. I don't care for him anymore. I don't want to be with him anymore. Now, at the age of 60, 70, I've seen people devastated and broken. And I've seen individuals. I had a teacher of mine who was like, I mean, he's like super old, like 78, 80 years old. So in his day and age, when marriage was the thing, it was like your cousin was prime choice number one, right? So he was like, when he was like, I know, he's like, I know my wife for like uh, 78 years. 
I'm like, aren't you 78? And then I realized, then he was like, oh yeah, he's like, she's my, she's my uh, uh, cousin. So like, yeah, we kind of grew up together. And I was like, I don't know if that counts, but we'll give it to you. Um, so she passed away, right? And we all love somebody. And I imagine like after 70, I mean, most people like, they, they have a breakdown if, the, if, if, they, if, if they have a breakup after seven days right? Uh, or, or a few weeks. And they're just like, oh my God, we were in love. And like, you know, he was the one, she was the one. Uh, he was my entire world. Uh, she was my world. And then a few months later, somebody else becomes your world. And then somebody else is like, we're building universes around here. But, uh, but anyway, what do you call, um, the point is, is that despite that loss, despite that loss of seven, se uh, of seven decades, his love for Allah and his message was far superior. So he knew, and that's why the dua, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un, what does that mean? We all belong to him, and we return to him, and we will meet each other on that day. So you don't truly lose anything. You don't have a loss of anything, because you'll see it again later on in life. And the love of Allah and the Prophet always remains, because that's the love that you can't fall out of. That's the love that we can, it's where we're always at the wrong. And he's always at the right. And he's always giving to us despite how much we forget him. I mean, he doesn't stop blessing us when we stop praying. He doesn't stop blessing us when we stop doubting him. He doesn't stop blessing us when we make him upset. He doesn't stop blessing us when we forget him. He blesses us regardless. And that's true love. He's there for us regardless. He answers us regardless. He might not answer everything. That's because this isn't the end game. We have a next life. And that's where he fulfills all the things that were short over here. All the du'as you didn't get answered here, he'll answer there. So getting over, the, uh, getting over a broken heart, attach your heart with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the true undying love. Learn to love Allah beyond everything else. And every other love will fall into the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you'll be able to get over heartbreaks. You'll be, get, be able to get over losses. People got divorced, not just today. They've been getting divorced for centuries. They've been getting divorced since the beginning. And people's spouses have been dying uh, in their lives for as, uh, as long as the world has been existing. But people are able to get over it. Khadija radiallahu anha was the Prophet's like beloved. He loved the prophets. She, he loved her so much that he used to say, Ruziqutu hubbaha. I have been sustained and nourished through her love. Like her love flows through me. And like when her friends would even, when he, her friends would come at the door and he would be like, it's like I'm hearing her again. And that's like in a loyal sense, not in the disloyal sense. Like where you're like, oh yeah, her friend's there? Oh yeah, let me go talk to her too. No, 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 it wasn't like that. The Prophet Wasallam, from a loyal and a genuine sense. Everything about her. And we're like, man, I hate your friends. I hate your parents. I hate your siblings. And that's what happens with like cultural love. That when we begin loving someone, we want everybody else to get cut off from them. Because we want to monopolize on that love. And we think that if they love others, they will diminish the love that they show to us. But that's not how love works. I can love uh, biryani and love someone else and my mom the same, right? It's two different types of love, right? You can love people on a different capacity. It doesn't mean, yeah, attention is a different thing. What we do is that in order to garner attention and solidify attention, we break other relationships, which is not right. And we see it in our families, we see it in our parents, we see it with our relatives. You can't go to their home, you can't go there. Don't, don't repeat the cycle. Learn that love won't grow in that manner. Love will grow based on your actions and based on how genuine you are and how good of an individual you are. That's how love will grow. And always ask Allah to bless your lives with love. Even once, inshallah, when you guys get married and whatnot, do dua for that as well. Because anybody can fall out of love. And anybody can just, just not care anymore. It's part of life. But you have to be ready to be able to embrace it and get over it. But if you never imagine that day to come, then you're unable to deal with it. And when it does come, you get broken and you're unable to progress. Your social life goes into sham, your work life goes into your school, everything. And then you start finding other ways of getting happy. You'll resort to drugs and drinking and partying and, 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 and just trying to get a rebound off of someone else. And, and you know, people try to rebound and, and get over, but then they look for that person in, in everyone, right? Uh, but they're rebounding. And they think that, okay, rebounds will work and I won't be in love with that person anymore. The only rebound is Allah. That's the only person you go to because that's the only love that will stick with you. And that's the only love that will give you better and contentment and happiness. 
And uh, lastly, how do you strengthen your memory? Um, Imam Shafi, rahmatullahi, how many of us know him? How many ever heard of his name? He was a really famous scholar, born in Palestine, uh, passed away in Egypt. Um, and uh, he was born in 150 Hijri, uh, about uh, 140 years after the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi passed away. He says that as a young boy, I, had a, I was struggling with my memory. So I went to my teacher, Shakautu ila waki'i bisu'i hifdi. I told him, it's a poem. He says, I, I, I have a, I, I struggle with memorizing. Fa'awsani bitarkil ma'asi. So he told me that if you want to strengthen your memory, especially in learning Quran and Hadith and Islamic knowledges, right? Um, this is particular to Islamic knowledge. And then there's just general knowledge. Um, he says, fa'awsani bitarkil ma'asi. He said, stop sinning. وَأَرْشَدَنِي And he told me, أَنَّ الْعِلْمَ نُورٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ That knowledge is light from Allah. It's nur from Allah. وَنُورُ اللَّهِ لَا يُعْطَى لِعَاسِي And the nur of God is not given to the one who disobeys God. So the first thing to do is control your sins. And out of all the sins, the first thing to control is these. These are the windows of the soul. Your eyes, they capture things. And they capture, they, 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 they reflect your spirituality. If you're able to control your gaze, Allah will automatically strengthen your memory. Allah will automatically bless your memory. That's the first thing. The second thing, um, reading Inna Atayna Kal Kawthar 11 times after Isha and 11 times after Fajr. That's the second thing. Number three is uh, when I was studying in South Africa, there was this guy from Turkey and uh, he had this amazing uh, course that he had taken back in Turkey. It was a memory course, and it's pretty cool. Um, and you can find this online. I don't know what the exact word of it is, is but what they do is basically, they uh, huh? they basically, um, you, you all can see from, basically, they take numbers, and they give each of these an image. So the one is a stick, the four is a chair, because upside down looks like a chair. Mine doesn't, but looks like a couch, but still. Uh, number three is a bow. And then for example, if I tell you a number like 314, then you think in your mind, okay, a bow is being shot at, uh, at a chair. So the arrow resembles, uh, the, the bow resembles three, the arrow resembles one, and the chair resembles four. So what they do is they basically train their memory um, through these different courses and programs where they develop a system of trying to coordinate and connect things. People ask me often that when I lecture, I go really off topic and then I come right back. And they're like, how are you able to know where you left off? Or like most of us have even completely lost track of where you are. And that's because I used to do this quite often. Um, anyway, so things of this sort, whether it's this memory games, I used to play a lot of memory games. I used to put cards down, uh, one deck, then two deck, then three deck, then four decks, then five decks, and just like just like a bunch of cards everywhere, and uh, and and the ability of of knowing where they all are. So you train. It's like any other muscle. You have to train it, right? You have to work on it. And if you don't, your memory will only get weaker and weaker and weaker as you age. So this is the time where you have to strengthen your memory. Because if you don't strengthen your memory now, it'll be too hard later on. But if your memory is strong now, it will slow the process of it becoming weak. And, and lastly, uh, or second to last, use it often. Memorize things often. Try to memorize something every single day. This will strengthen your memory. I, I memorize poetry all the time. And that's just because I want to sharpen my memory. I want to have the ability to be able to memorize. I hear numbers, I hear something, I try to memorize it immediately. Uh, addresses, I try to memorize it immediately. And that's the whole thing. I'm just trying to sharpen my memory. And last, but definitely not least, eat badam, eat almonds. <laughs> um, okay. Um, This, I'll do one question from here, and then the next questions we'll do next week. And if you, you can ask, uh, add more of these questions for next week, inshallah, and we'll cover them, inshallah. How do you convince a brother who is a felon to stop selling prescription? He applied to 14 jobs and couldn't secure one. 
Oh, I, how do you convince someone to break the cycle of their mistakes? I think that's what they're asking me. Um, so usually the question is a one-liner, but then people give you a whole story for it. Uh, and that's why I generally don't answer questions on phone call because people tell me the whole background story. And the question was just like, oh, I broke my wudu. What do I do now? It's like, <laughs> all right, yeah, just, that's the question, right? That's, you could have texted that to me. Um, but uh, but uh, someone's in a cycle that they can't break. There's a prophetic way of solving that. Now, this person who's selling drugs or this person who's involved in drinking or smoking or whatever sin that they're committing, how do you break away from a sin that you've been consistent on? We've all heard the story of the guy who killed 99 people. And then he feels remorse. So he goes to this person. And this person wasn't a very, he wasn't a scholar. He was just an educated person. So he went to him and the hadith makes the distinction. That's why you should ask your Islamic questions to scholars and not just anyone or just Google them up. So he goes to the person. He says, hey, man. Uh, so I got to talk to you. And he's like, hey, what's up? What happened? He's like, I killed 99 people. Do you think Allah will forgive me? He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah no, no, you're not getting forgiven. He's like, you're done, man. You're like, you're, 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 you're finished. And uh, he's like, oh, okay, we'll make it 100. Uh, so that guy, that guy gets killed too. Uh, so then he goes to the imam now. And he goes to the imam and he says like, uh, hey, so I killed 99 people and I feel really bad about it. And um, then I asked this guy and he said, I can't get forgiven. So then I killed him too. So now it's at 100. He's like, do you think I can get forgiven? And the guy's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you how you'll get forgiven. You go as far from here as possible and you go to a different town. Uh, I'm just joking. I'm, I, I, I've, I've, I've humorified the, the, the story. But he said to him that, look, you have a problem. And, and this place motivates you to do sin. There's another town. Travel. Go away from here. And in the other town, you'll find good people there. Adopt good company. Keep good friends around you. And they'll help you break away from your bad habit. So he goes. And on the way there, he passes away in the middle. And the rest of the story, everybody knows. The point is that when you're stuck in a cycle of sin, you have to step away from the area or your hometown. And that especially happens with drugs and drinking and and, and relationships because there the memories are solidified there your access is there you go to another city at least you I mean will you be able to make those connections again yeah you can but if you're trying to change you won't make those connections again you can make connections anywhere you can do haram anywhere but if you're serious about change you won't do it right or wrong good inshallah jazakallah khair for everyone for coming um, there's also one more thing um, can you write the um, sorry I know you were trying to take a picture but um can you write the, the link mwk.as.me slash MSA? So every week uh, after this class, um, from about 7 o'clock till I think 8 or 9 o'clock, you can schedule 15 minutes or half an hour or something. If you, anyone needs to talk, anyone has any problems, anyone has any issues, they need some uh, private uh, um, advice, uh, they can talk. For the next half an hour, I'll be around... What's the, what's the rest dot of the dot me slash MSA. If you do the memory game, you'll remember it next time. I, tell yeah. you. <laughs> I literally thought of that right when I forgot. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, for, for uh, when the class ends at 6.30 till 7 o'clock, I'll still be around here. If people just want to come and ask and talk or something. But if someone wants to have a personal time, uh, they have the opportunity every week. You just have to reserve the time. Uh, inshallah, so, it's, it's, so it's, you're not interrupted. Um, there's no one else there at that time. And the place where we do it, where is this place? Right now it's in the SSB building. The S, is, this, is that in this building? Yeah, this building over at SSB. Yeah, so you can find out from Hafiz Taha. Uh, but if you sign up there, you'll just get an email to tell you which room it's in. Uh, because apparently we, pl we play uh, musical rooms here uh, every week. It's the big room in SSA, SSB. Like, are you talking about the, the, the last, last one? one? Okay. Yeah. Everybody wants to see you there. <laughs> yeah. We're, we're trying to get a smaller room. Yeah. yeah, last week there was a person talking to me. There was a group of people that came to look at the sign that said, this is one-on-one -on -one sessions with... Uh, yeah. And they still, went, <laughs> still came inside. <laughs> and I was just like, you know what? Uh, it's all good. <laughs> but, uh, Jazakallah khair. And, uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.